Daniel 9, we'll pick up in verse 15. And as we look at this chapter, and, and we'll get close to finishing it tonight in, in some ways, but we'll pick up next week with the real interpretation of this final week of mankind's sojourn on earth. Tonight we really have the second half of Daniel's prayer. And again, there are so many things in this prayer that we could look at and, and just take to heart. Uh, it begins with the content really of this prayer. And this is again, so important for your own personal prayer life to see the prayer of Daniel from that perspective. How Daniel approaches the throne of the way maker the king of heaven, the light of the darkness, the, the, the one who was and is and is to come. This is, this is a man's heart that's, that's bare before the Lord. This, this is a man that's going, expecting the Lord to hear every word and do something with every single word he hears. And so I, I pray that it'll speak to you tonight. It, it has to me uh, many times throughout my time walking with the Lord, and as I was studying again this afternoon, I just go, Lord, you are so good uh, to remind us of these truths. And so would you pray with me? We'll pick up in verse 16 here in Daniel 9. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've given us this incredible example of this wonderful prophet, this man, this senior saint, that one day we're gonna get the meat in heaven. And th the one who stood when everyone else bowed. The one who understood what it's like to cast his cares upon you, knowing that you care for him in the most dangerous of circumstances. Lord, the one that trusted you when there really wasn't a reason to trust. From Earth's perspective, it looked like you had given up, that you've moved your hand away from the children of Israel and from his own life. And yet he kept crying out to you. And so we pray that you'd speak to us through your word. Encourage us, Lord. I pray if there's someone here tonight that's downcast, would you lift up their eyes? Would you cause them to see uh, the one who is in heaven, but who's also here dwelling with us as Emmanuel? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now the content of that prayer, which we began last time, with this prophetic view of things to come, and now really the heart, the soul of it. And you're gonna see at least seven major things here, um, but there are 10 pleas that Daniel's going to make uh, of various different kinds. Oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, one of the secrets to prayer is understanding who God is and who we are not. Understanding who God is and who we are not. And, and it, as Daniel recognizes this, the first thing he says is, Lord, according to your righteousness. Notice what's missing. Not according to what I think, what the world says, what seems to be right, what might be able to be logically discerned, O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray that your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, from your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Daniel opens this prayer with the plain and simple acknowledgement that he's part of the problem. The people that he knows are part of the problem, his own people, the chosen people, the Jewish people. The Israelites are part of the problem. You know, sometimes I think we are a little hesitant to actually take responsibility for us being a part of the problem. We, we try and push things off, and well, Lord, it's not really my fault. It's, it's not really, our people's fault, it's someone else's fault. It's not mine and it isn't us. The blame belongs somewhere else. And I love that Daniel begins by taking accountability personally for what's going on in the nation Israel. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication 
And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear and open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city, which is called by your name, we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Amen? When you go to God, it's not because you're great, it's because he's great. It's not because you've performed well, and of course, you know, God has to hear you. Every single time we go to God, 100% of the time is my suggestion to you. Go with the attitude that you're seeking the mercy of the king. Actually recognize who he is. And even in our best efforts, you might call it our personal perfection or, or maybe our personal holiness, the, the things that you and I could say we have done right. And, and I would hope and pray that everyone in this room can say there are some things you believe you've done right before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Some of you think you've done a few things that the Lord's actually thankful for. I do. I believe that there are all kinds of things that each one of us really have done before the Lord for which we would expect him to go, that was a good thing. But even in those good things, we should go to the Lord saying, please, Lord, don't give me what I have deserved or earned. That's what mercy is. It's not, Lord, pay me for my goodness. It's not, Lord, pay me for whatever I've done. It might not be worth much, but it's worth something, so give me what I've earned. I don't want God to give me what I've earned. I want him to give me exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that I can ask or think, none of which have I earned. And so I really want his mercy. I want his grace. I want his unmerited favor. And so Daniel recognizes that as he opens this prayer. The things that we say to God are because of, not because of our own righteous deeds, but because of his great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and for your people who are called by your name. Do you see anything there at the end of that? It's God's name, it's God's city, it's God's people. This is God's church, we are God's people. This is God's house. You know, upon occasion, someone will come and they'll be intending, and I do take it the way they intend it, and they'll say something like, man, your church is just so loving or awesome, or they'll make some comment and they'll, they'll say something that, that is nice. And in as kind a way as I possibly can, I can say, it's not mine. It's the Lord's. This is God's house. We are God's people. This belongs to him. No, no man should ever take credit for the things the Lord does. No person should ever lay their hands on God's things. And, and so in that very same way, Daniel is recognizing, look, this this city which is in ruin, which will be rebuilt by the, the, the great builder and warrior Nehemiah. It's in ruins. The children of Israel have been in Babylon for almost the full 70 years. The first temple is destroyed. And so Daniel is going to God saying, God, it's your reputation. It's your city. We are your people. We're even called by your name. The name of the Jewish people, Israel, governed by God. Even the name we possess is your name, God. And in the very same way, we are known as Christians, amen? which means little Christs, little pictures of Jesus. We bear the name of the one who saved us. And so Daniel opens this prayer 
with these statements. And he simply says, Lord, turn your wrath. Turn your anger away from Jerusalem. You have every right. What he's saying de facto is this. Without admitting all of the little bits and pieces and parts, he's saying, look, you have every reason to be displeased. We've done everything we can to mess things up, but would you please not give us what we've deserved and earned? Would you turn your anger and turn your wrath, even though you would be right to punish us? We're begging for your mercy. I've learned as I've gotten older that I need God's mercy more, I think, than I actually desire and cling to his grace. I'm grateful for his grace, but his grace is a gift. Once he's given me his grace, it's a gift. It's a grace gift. But his mercy is new when? Every morning. Amen. You know why? Because we do something to jack up our relationship with God. We do something to deserve something other than his mercy. I say something. I do something. I act in some way. I mess it up. And so every day I find myself at the mercy seat. It's like, Lord, please don't, don't give me what I've deserved. We've messed up your holy hill. In this case, it's literally talking about Zion and Jerusalem. But in a figurative way, we, we can move it into our time domain, into the age of grace and say, my body that's a temple of the Lord Man, there's some things. It's like, I've had way too many cheeseburgers in my life. My cholesterol is the way it is because I have not heeded the voice of the Lord when I go to In-N-Out. There are all kinds of things where you can could, you could look at it and go, man, God, no wonder I deserve these things. Turn your anger and turn your wrath. Your righteous wrath, by the way. God's anger is perfect. His wrath is also perfect. Hear my prayers, he says. Hear my petitions. He, he's saying, you don't have to listen to me. And I, and I want to say something. This may shock you. God doesn't have to listen to you. God does not have to listen to you. He's God. He could turn his ear away if he wanted to. Now, the good news is he doesn't but he doesn't have to listen to you. So it would be really nice when you're praying, Lord, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for turning your ear my way. Thank you, God, because you could have done something else. He's righteous, he's perfect, he's holy. He's got other things on his plate, amen? And yet God inclines his ear towards his people, towards his children, and he listens. And so Daniel acknowledges that, Lord, please, Hear my prayer. Look with favor on your house, God. Now, as we said this morning, one of the conditions for us to receive the blessings of the Lord is to repent. Let's just say, Lord, this is your house. We, we've done the house cleaning. Look with favor on your sanctuary. And so he admits in that sense to his part in it. He's saying, look, I, I messed up. Thank you for not giving me what I messed up. And he goes on, and you can see these things. Incline your ear to hear. In other words, how many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hands. If you're a parent, children are born with a unique gift called selective hearing. <laughs> and so, as a parent, we can generally always hear our kids. You can pick your kids out in a crowd of voices, can't you? You know, that's your child's scream, that's their yell, that's their mommy, that's their daddy. When your children speak, you always hear them. But when they have gotten themselves into trouble, we don't always act on what we hear, do we? And in the very same way, your father always hears you. But if you want him to do something, you might actually want to acknowledge the fact that you're wrong. That's what we're waiting for with our children. We're waiting for them to say, I messed up, Dad, can you help? 
God, in the same way, is waiting for us to communicate to him our heart's desires, like, Lord, I, I, I messed up. I really need you here. Turn your ear my way, please. Please, Lord. See the desolations of your city that bears your name. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This church is his church. All that is the church in the world is the, is the bride of Christ, amen? The bride of Christ was given to the bridegroom. It's already his. So all these things are pointing us towards who's really supposed to be in charge. That's why we call him Lord, by the way, amen? It means master. That means he's in charge. He, he, he in, in, a, in a sense, should always be respected and, and should be approached with awe and wonder. Anybody in here ever wonder why God talks to you or listens to you at all? Because if you're like me, you know who you are, amen? So you know that there are times when God should not listen to you and God certainly shouldn't talk to you and he really shouldn't answer anything that you ask him just based on who you actually really are and yet he does. This is mind boggling to me and the prayer of Daniel acknowledges this fact. It's like, look, we have sinned against you. We've done everything we possibly can to mess up this relationship that we have with you. Not just us, but our forefathers did as well. And yet he knows in the heart of hearts that God's still listening. And God wants to answer. And so he says, listen, act, don't delay. And this is really a picture, of course, of the disciples' prayer that Jesus gives us. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, Lord, holy is your name. Because of who you are, that's why we're approaching your throne. The reason we can come is because we know who you are. And in a very interesting way, Moses has the same experience. If you want to turn, there's Exodus 32, verses 11 through 14. A little bit different spin on it, though because things had gotten immeasurably worse for the Jewish people in captivity. They've now been delivered. The first Passover has happened. Pharaoh's army's been defeated. They're wandering in the wilderness. And verse 11, and Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. In other words, look, you saved us. You, you brought us out. Why are you still upset? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Why indeed? They had become ungrateful unthankful, disrespectful, and every time God turned around, they were doing exactly what God told them not to do. Turn your face, your fierce wrath, and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, or Jacob, whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. This is the classic intercessory prayer in the Old Testament. It's like he's asking this rhetorical question, why, Lord, would you do that? He knows the answer. This is the same Moses who said, Lord, the people you gave me this is the same Moses that departs for 40 days, comes back down the mountain, and the Jewish people are partying hardy at the base. They've made a golden calf out of their earrings, and then they lie about it by saying, well, the calf just kind of walked out of the fire. Moses knew exactly why God's wrath was inclined against them, and yet... He, he knows exactly how he needs to approach the throne of God. 
Lord, I know your character. I know you promise to take care of us. Do you know the promises that God has made in your life? Moses knew God's character. Do you know God's character? When you approach the throne, are you going to the throne of God understanding the character of the one that you're praying to? That he actually loves you. That his plans for you are good. They are not evil. They are a future. They're hopeful. That he desires to bless you as you bless him. That he is yes and amen towards all of his promises. A church. This is the way we should live in our own prayer lives before the Lord. It's like, God, we may not deserve this. Lord, I understand why you're angry. You have every right, and I'm part of the problem. But God, I know your character. One of the things that strengthens my own faith at times when I look at the world is I know the character of my God. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. I know my God. So, so I know that person with whom I, I might have a vehement disagreement. God still loves them. I know that person that I'm talking to that intends evil. I know that he is able to redeem to the uttermost. And his hand of reconciliation is towards his people who fear him. Daniel lived this way his entire life so far as the scriptures are concerned. And I believe that's the secret to the power of that's in his prayer. And so he simply says, Lord, please listen. Lord, please forgive. Lord, hear our cry and please act. Don't delay. And if you look at the verbs that are in this particular passage, listen, forgive, hear, act, don't delay. Daniel's saying, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, this is who you are. We can count on you. And so he confessed his sin and he sought the mercy of God. If you want an effective prayer life, confess your sin and seek the mercy of God. Tell him what's up. Now here's the crazy thing, he already knows. He already knows. There is power in the vocalization of our problems. I will get asked occasionally, well why do we even have to pray? I mean, God already knows what we have need of before we do. That is true. But he is waiting for your prayer to get legs. He's waiting for your faith to have works. And in this case, your faith working is asking. It is the physical, legitimate act of saying, God, I want to tell you what's wrong. And I want to beseech you to fix it. It's not just sitting around going, well, he'll do it because he's good. He's sovereign. That is not a prayer life. That is not a prayer life. If you want a prayer life that's going to be vibrant, you have to acknowledge where you have messed up and throw yourself on the mercy of the Lord. Frequently and often, even in the little things. And you'll find that God works with those little things. Look at the power in this prayer. Look at the focus, really, if you want to. Verse 20, and now, while I was speaking, you can see it. And now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, notice whose mountain it is, whose God it is, whose people it is. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me at the time of the evening offering. So at about sundown. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. 
I, I'm bringing you the ability to know some things that other people don't know. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, you are greatly beloved, and therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Now, look at the focus. Now, in that moment, there is a now moment for every person in this room, daily, hourly, minute by minute with the Lord. There is a now moment where you're speaking with God and God is going to speak to you. But if you don't begin the process by seeking his face, that now moment is delayed. God wants to speak to you, but he is waiting for you to initiate the conversation. Any of you have ever been in a situation to where you, you need to get something resolved? What has to happen in order for it to get resolved? Someone has to initiate the conversation, amen? And so if God already knows what's happening, I think we can take him off of the list of needful initiators, if you will. He, he doesn't need to initiate. He will, by his Holy Spirit, remind us of our faults, because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and of righteousness, amen? That's what Jesus said. And so the Holy Spirit is prompting us to initiate the conversation with God. And that's what we see in this passage. Daniel could have just sat around. He said, you know what, ah, it's not that big a deal. It's the very same prayer that we looked at last week in 2 Chronicles 7. One that you all undoubtedly can probably quote. If my people are called by my name, it's the same principle. It's look there, we're God's people. It's his name. It's his church. And so in this prayer life of Daniel, the power in it is in the answer that comes there in 2 Chronicles, not in verse 14, but 15. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. For I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be here forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. And as for you, if you walk as your father David walked and do according to all that I've commanded you, if you keep all my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with your David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. You, you see, the answer comes when we initiate the conversation and we say, God, it's my fault. What do we do about it? How do we fix it? We're asking for God's input into our life. It's why Paul, as he wrote to the church in Rome, it's why James, as he spoke to the church in James 5, he says, confess your faults one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. For the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. It avails much. Why does he say that? Because it is the initiation of the conversation with God that brings the healing. It's when we say, God, we need you to intervene in this circumstance. God already knows he needs to intervene. God fully understands everything that's going to be happening. He, he's sovereign. So the active ingredient is our initiation of the line of communication in heaven. It's like, Lord, I'm dialing you up. I've shared with you before, keep your, keep your spiritual cell phone on speakerphone, amen? Just wander around saying, Lord, help. Lord, act. Lord, listen. Lord, save me. Whatever is your condition, you don't want to go through it and then ask God for help after the fact. You want him to help while there's still an opportunity to change the outcome, amen? That's called initiation. And the sooner you initiate that phone call to heaven, the better off you will be. The moment we pray, the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance to the will of God the Father. Verse 26 of Romans 8, and it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. In other words, you ever go to the Lord and kind of like, I'm here, but I'm not sure exactly why? And in the process of praying, the Lord opens up the floodgates of your mind to reveal the things that need to get to heaven? 
That's what the Apostle Paul is writing about here in Romans 8. Sometimes I don't know exactly what to pray for, but you know who knows exactly what to pray for? God. And when you initiate the conversation in heaven, when you open the door, when you dial up the line, when you say, God, I need to talk to you. Can we talk, please? He starts filling your head with the things that need to be spoken about. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of how our prayer life is intended by the Lord to go. The Spirit making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes it's just, I don't know if you guys do this, and sometimes it's like, oh, man. That's my prayer. It's like, I have no idea, Lord. Ugh. Now, he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And it is in that context, now I want you to notice this, that is the context of Romans 8, 28. For he works together to the good all things to those who love him and are the called according to his purposes. You see, the context is prayer, isn't it? The context is the Holy Spirit opening our minds and our hearts to talk to God in a meaningful way. The context of Romans 8, 28 is the conversation initiated in heaven. It's like the moment I begin to talk to God, he begins speaking to me. The moment I open up the door, he's like, Jeff, good to hear you. It's nice to see you. What you been doing? Yeah, I saw that other thing that was going on in your life. You know, I can help with that. That's how the Holy Spirit works. But if we just kind of ramble about the, the, any of you ever get, do you, do you shop at Ikea? If you're a man and you're in here, shame on us. Because here's what we do at Ikea. We buy the Ikea furniture. They all have all these cool Swedish parts. You do need a degree in engineering to know what they do. And you take home the little bag, and there's 15 parts in that box, and they have to be assembled in exactly the right order, don't they? And you have to follow precisely the instructions, like do not tighten down all of these things until you are done. But us being men, honey, watch this as I tighten this down. And you get out the big torque wrench. And now these parts no longer go together. You still have all the screws, you got all the parts, but you didn't talk to the engineer that designed this thing. You ignored the instruction. You did not open up the communication. You said, I already got this. I know how it goes together. Any fool can see there's only 15 parts in here. There are 16 screws. That means there's one extra. This should be easy. A lot of people pray like that. Oh, there's only 15 things going on today. There's 16 possibilities. Do some multiplications. Not too bad. I'm going to go it on my own. Oh, how we need the directions from heaven. We need God to speak to us. And so it is ultimately on us. It is incumbent upon us. God's going to fully answer all these things in eternity, isn't he? We're going to know all things when we finally get there. But we're not there yet. So we need some answers in the here and now. And Daniel's prayer was filled with that kind of power just like Isaiah said there in Isaiah 65, it says, before they call, I will answer. And while they're speaking, I will hear. God's like sitting there on the edge of heaven's throne going, they're gonna call me. They're gonna ask. And I'm waiting. And the moment they begin to in incline their voice to heaven, I'm gonna start the process but I'm gonna wait for them to talk to me. Here's why. Because when God does that, we recognize we can't go it on our own. We see exactly how much we need him. I know that I need God to speak into my life. There's no such thing as Christian autopilot. Did you know that? 
There is no such thing as Christian autopilot. There's no button on your life that you can push it and you can just go to sleep and the plane of your life is gonna land safely in some foreign country. You need to be constant communication in constant communication with the tower. For those of you that have ever done any flying, when you get over a heavily populated area, when the airspace is crowded, there is so much going on in your headset as you're, as you're approaching the tower and all of a sudden you've got all these voices going on. Uh, 269 er you have runway 17, right? And you're like, what? I think I'm on final approach on 17, right? Now imagine that there are somewhere around 7 billion people on the earth. How many people do you think are trying to land on your same runway? You need to know exactly when your turn is. You need to know whether you need to go around one more time. You need to figure out, are, are you supposed to be under that plane or over that plane? We need power in our prayer lives. God answers this by giving Daniel a mystery. And we'll unpack this whole thing next time. So don't worry about getting through it with me tonight. Uh, we're gonna tackle the actual interpretation of Daniel 77's next week. But it says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined. This is the answer. It says, here's what I want you to know. You're inclining your ear, you're listening, you're hearing God. I'm speaking to you, I wanna hear. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And he names the things that are going to happen. Now I want you to look very closely and so you can prep yourself for next time. For your people, who are God's people in this context? This is national Israel. This is the Jewish people. This is not the church. The church doesn't exist yet. He's speaking in the future. Why? Because he names some things that have still to this day not happened. To finish the transgression. Have the Jewish people seen their Messiah yet? Do they understand salvation by grace and through faith? One at a time, yes. Individual Jewish people have come to faith in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. But as a country, as a people, and that's who's in view, that is absolutely not the case. So tonight, this particular dream, this final week of these 70 weeks is still yet future for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. How are your sins made an end to? And how is a reconciliation made for our iniquity? There's only one, one way, amen? and one truth and one life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. There's only one way that can happen. To bring everlasting righteousness, how does that happen? Only one way that can happen. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now I want you to notice a couple of things, and again, you can just chew on these until we get together next Sunday night. At the time this was written, there was no temple on the Temple Mount. It had been destroyed. The first temple is gone. It would be the second temple that would be bemoaned by the Jewish people that it did not have the glory of the first temple. The first one is gone. The second one hasn't been built yet. So there is no holy place to anoint at the time of Daniel. There would be another temple that would be greatly enlarged and improved and made extremely beautiful through Solomon's efforts and then ultimately through Herod the Great. Herod's great temple, making currying favor with the Jewish people. That temple also does not exist anymore. You can see the remains of the stones tossed off the walls by Titus and his troops in AD 70 at the base of the wall on the southern and western side of the city of Jerusalem today. There is still no temple. And so these seven predictions 
Seventy sevens are decreed for your people to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness. Kind of sounds like get saved, doesn't it? For your people to come to faith in Messiah. That's why it's so wrong to spiritualize this passage and apply it to the church because it says your people and your holy city. The church has no holy city. Do you understand what I'm saying? The city of Jerusalem is God's holy city and his people are the Jewish people. We're his church. We're his bride. We're his friends. We're his beloved. But God's chosen people are the Jewish people. They're the apple of his eye still to this day. And he has a plan for their future. And one day he will allow the anointing of the most holy place. And so the church is not the focal point of this passage of scripture. And it certainly is talking about salvation through Messiah, which we know the Jewish people rejected Messiah. And in fact, the high priest and his assistant, also the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas, are the ones responsible for Jesus' death ultimately. When in all actuality, you and I killed Jesus, our sin did. But they were the ones that said he's guilty. He's guilty of blasphemy. He's guilty of breaking the Sabbath. He's guilty of all of these transgressions against God. He's declared himself Messiah. And in fact, it was him saying yes to the fact. It is as you say, I am. That's what actually caused the high priest to tear his garment. Blasphemy. He just declared himself God. But one day, Daniel saw into the future a time when Israel would be redeemed. Come to know Messiah. Nation Israel hasn't gotten to that place yet, amen? You travel to Israel, if you go with us, one of the things that will strike you is we, we talk about the Temple Mount all the time. And it is still called the Temple Mount. It's really called the Haram al-Sharif because it's actually a giant Muslim worship center currently. There are four mosques. There are two on the top of the Temple Mount and there's one underneath in Solomon's former stables. There's no temple on the Temple Mount still. But there will be. And it might be sooner than you think. Because some additional details are going to come into view as we finish the remainder of this. And so this is a view of Israel's future that still lies ahead. And so he decrees these, in essence, this, what is going to happen in years to come. It still awaits Israel's adoption of the, of the new covenant. Zechariah tells us it will be just prior to Christ's coming. Uh, and so he uses this word that we translate sevens. There are 70 sevens appointed to your people. In the Greek Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, the Greek word used there is heptad. And heptad, much like our word dozen, simply means seven of something in this case. Whereas dozen means 12 of something, amen? You could have a dozen years, you could have a dozen months, you could have a dozen days, you could have a dozen seconds, you could have a dozen donuts. But a dozen is dozen. Heptad, or its Hebrew word, which is shabua, simply means seven of something. It's a collection. And so liberal theologians uh, attempt to say that these 77s were 490 days. Must be days. Those who don't believe that the Lord is going to come back to this earth and put his feet on Mount Zion and on the Mount of Olives is going to cleave in two, those that look at this symbolically say that Jesus isn't going to come back and rule and reign on this earth. And so they also 
look at it as a period of indefinite time, but definitely not anything specific. When I think we can actually understand what these sevens really are. You, you see, if you were talking about a week or seven days, we have a picture of that in scripture. So if it was intended for us to understand this as days, as it is in Exodus 20, then we would have been given some way to understand it. Mornings and evenings, much like in the creation, on the morning of the first day and on the evening of the first day. We understand that those were solar days. But there's none of that in this passage. A week of years makes a whole bunch of sense when you look at the reason that the children of Israel are actually in this predicament in the first place. Because we're told why in Leviticus 25. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards, and gather your crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath unto the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. And if you look back at the history of Israel, they had missed the Sabbaths for 490 years. So how many Sabbath years would that be? It would be 70. And so for 70 Sabbath years, they are in captivity in Babylon. And that time's about to come to the end. Daniel understood his Bible in that sense. This week of years would have been just as familiar uh, to the Jewish people as a week of days is to us. And therefore, I believe that the only way to look at this is that this prophecy of this final seven years that's missing from this puzzle, which we'll get to next time, means that it is a seven-year period or a week of years that's still missing. And we're gonna pull this all apart next week. And so the end of our time tonight, notice how this finishes and how it wraps up. Pick up in verse 25, we'll read down through verse 27, and again, we'll pick up the interpretation of the 70, 77s and the intervening year, that re, or the Sabbath that rem, remains, the one seven-year period. Know this and understand. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one. Now, I want you to hear this really, really carefully. We know exactly when this decree went out, and again, we'll pull all this apart. We, we have the book of Nehemiah to be referring to. We have an excavation of the broad wall of Nehemiah. The wall of Nehemiah's time has been heavily excav excavated in Jerusalem. We know exactly where it is. We've seen it. So from the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem, which is going to be given to Daniel, which will be carried out through Nehemiah the prophet. The ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So we are told exactly how long that's gonna take, 483 years. And again, we'll pull all this apart next week. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. This is speaking of the time of Messiah. This is giving us a date for the arrival and the crucifixion of Jesus. And after 62 weeks, Messiah himself should be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who are those? Because the city is gonna be rebuilt. Daniel's been crying out to God, your holy city is a wreck. Your name has been slandered. Daniel's told, we're gonna do something about it. And they shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war of desolations is determined. There, there's going to be a time 
when desolation is once again going to come. And then he, who's the he, the prince who is to come. And then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. If a week is a week of years, then that one week is one seven-year period. But in the middle of the week, if a week is a week of years, it's seven. If it's in the middle, that's after three and a half years. Starting to sound familiar to anybody in here? And he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering. One of the ploys of the Antichrist is he will be allowing the Jewish people to rebuild the third and final temple before Ezekiel's temple in the millennial reign on the Temple Mount. If that were to start tonight, you would have a war in the Middle East instantaneously. The Temple Mount is not even controlled by Israel. Errol Sharon, when he conquered the Temple Mount in 1967, the following morning, gave it back to Jordan because he knew the incredible difficulty that would come upon the Jewish people if they kept the Temple Mount. So the Temple Mount today is primarily a Muslim place of worship. It is the third most holy site in Islam, only after Mecca and Medina. But it is also the most holy site to Israel. That's why the Jewish people flock to the Western Wall, the Haq Hotel, uh, that's as close as they can get to the former temple. And in fact, when a number of rabbis opened up a Jewish t a tunnel uh, inside of a Muslim neighborhood, but underneath the Herodian walls and into the Temple Mount to get up underneath the Dome of the Rock Mosque, the Jewish government sealed the tunnels because it would have started a war. And yet, this says, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering. The only way to have sacrifices, the only way to have offerings, if the people are the Jewish people, is there must be a temple. There wasn't one in Daniel's time. The one that got rebuilt ended up getting improved also got destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. There isn't a temple now. The Messiah had not come until the time of the Romans. And so all this is still yet future. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even into the consummation which is determined and that is poured out on the desolate. This whole thing is attached to a very unique name, Mashiach, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one who was and is and is to come, the Christ, the Messiah, the Prince. You know, it's interesting to me, Pilate actually got it right, didn't he? You ever thought about this? Pilate, for all of his arrogance, got it right because that sign that was over Jesus' head said, this is Jesus. This is Yehoshua. This is God who is salvation and he is the king of the Jews. Mind-boggling that Herod, thinking he could mess with everyone by putting the title for the Messiah up there, actually spoke the truth through that titulus, that sign that hung over Jesus' head. That's why the prophet Isaiah, when we get to chapter three, for he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was born upon him, and by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. There's only one name whereby anyone may be saved. That's why it's the peace of Christ that rules in our hearts, amen? Colossians chapter three. 
That's why when we read that beautiful passage in Isaiah 9, it's one of our favorite Christmas passages. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful and Counselor and Mighty God. Part of his name there is Prince of Peace, isn't it? When you go to Israel today, one thing you're not gonna find is peace. You'll find conflict. You'll find a verge of war almost constantly. You'll, you'll find a lot of people who are very irreligious, actually. Most Jewish people care very little for the things of God. They will tell you, well, I'm actually secular. In other words, they're, they're Jewish by heritage, they're Jewish by right and lineage, and they are still God's chosen people, but they will tell you, oh, it's just gotten us in so much trouble, we'd rather just not deal with that right now. But one day, the king's coming. Exactly what the Apostle Paul envisioned in Romans chapter 11. One day, all Israel will be saved. It's going to be a glorious time. Amen? Would you stand with me and we'll pray. Bring some of the pastors up front. Maybe you've got something heavy on your heart after service. You need to pray with somebody. Next week is going to be fun. It's an exciting, exciting passage of scripture to take apart. So we'll decode the sevens next time. Father, thank you. Thank you for speaking into our lives through your word, which is eternal. It's not the writings of man. You spoke these things to Daniel. He wrote them down. Others after him copied them correctly. Lord, the copies that we have of this amazing book Lord, tell us that it was written well before you, Jesus, were that baby, that child that was born, that son that was given, the babe in a manger in Bethlehem. Before you came, we knew you were coming. And so we trust you with all things that you've said would come to pass in your coming, and we want to give you all things that are still yet to come to pass in your second coming as you rapture the church and deal with mankind for how they've treated the Jewish people, what they've done to the land of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob for the dispersion of the Jewish people around the world or those promises of Joel. God, we thank you that you will make good on everything you have ever said with regard to the Jewish people. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We ask you, God, to move in our midst by your spirit Grow your church, Lord. Make us hungry for your word. Cause us to have a prayer life that inclines our ear to heaven and begs for your ear to hear us. In Jesus' name, amen.